let's talk a little bit more about object-oriented programming and its basic principles. Today we're going to look at a specific subject called inheritance, which is one of the key pillars of the idea. So, the structure of today's lecture is the following. We will discuss a little bit more about the context of on object-oriented programming. We'll look at a simple example. We'll look at access rules for inherited class members, constructors in derived classes, overriding functions and multiple inheritance. Some of these may not yet make sense to you, but they will be, hopefully, by the end of the session. Okay, so let's look a little bit about what object-oriented program was really about. Hopefully that's becoming a little bit clearer by all the examples we've been doing. But today we're going to really distinguish between the traditional procedural programming, which focuses on what you do with data, which the idea is that the program is primarily a procedure to process data, data used as usually input at the beginning of a program and output at the end, and in between they get manipulated by the code, the procedures we've written. Object-oriented programming turns this around to an extent. You need to think about how you want to organize the data and what operations do I allow to be performed on it. So data are really the primary concern. It has a very natural consequences that object-oriented programming is very modular. Classes are something like a mini program and we use non-member functions outside the class to glue all of this together and implement the processes through the objects which we want our code to do. So, in general, object-oriented programming is based on three important concepts. Encapsulations, the idea that data and methods that act on the data are defined together within a class. These data methods are used via objects and the programming has full control over how data and functions are accessed. That really gives the, uh, rise to the idea of security as well. Inheritance, which says there's a way to define relationship between classes. A derived class can inherit the members, both data and methods, of a parent-based class. Typical buzzword here is specialization, which we'll discuss towards the end of today's lecture. The final one, which we won't be able to reach today completely, is polymorphism, the idea to create multiple derived classes with the same functions but with different actions. And here we usually say one interface, multiple methods. And what we've really been using up to now is the first. We've defined isolated classes and used them through their instances or th through their objects, which is the same thing. In larger programs, we may want to create class hierarchies. This is where we use inheritance. And to use polymorphism, we first need to understand how to implement inheritance. So that's why polymorphism will have to wait until the next time. Okay, let's start with an example. The example is based on the Galaxy class code, which we used in assignment 4, but in a slightly different way. So, we look at the most general object we can see in the sky. Let me call it the celestial object, which maybe have a name. It will have a mass, a distance, and in principle a luminosity. And then we, have an, we can create an object like that in the standard way. And we, we also have a parameterized constructor, which actually constructs the object based on the arguments. And, in, and then initializes all the entries in our class. We've got an accessor function, which gets, returns the name value from a class. And we finally got a friend that inserts the celestial object in an O-stream. And we declare that function outside the class as it should. Then in the main program, we can initialize the celestial object. Here we've used the large Magellanic cloud. I set the luminosity to minus one because I don't really know what it is. Uh, I know there's about 20 billion solar masses heavy and has a redshift of 0 0.000875. And then we can output the object afterwards. And clearly if you run the code, it will run perfectly fine and it will output all of the information shown on the screen over here. Now let's say what we, we want to create a class for galaxies. And a galaxy is just an example of an object in the sky. So inheritance is the right way to go. We can create a new class called galaxy that inherits the members of celestial object. 
as well as having members of its own, for example, in this case, the Hubble type. In C++, the celestial class is actually known as the base class, and the galaxy class is the derived class. So let's see how this works by looking at an example. So we modify our code a little bit, we add a galaxy class in there, we say public celestial object, we'll have to tell, uh, explain a little bit what that means later on, and then that class will have its own constructor uh, and its own destructor and has its own function to insert into an O stream, which we then implement afterwards. And the code almost looks the same, apart from the fact we now declare a Galaxy LMC, and for the Galaxy we also declare its Hubble type, which we set over there. Now the one change we make to this code, if you open this, is that in the Celestial Object class we've made all its members public, and we'll see later on why that has to be done. If we run this, this produces some sensible output, and we're quite happy and satisfied, but not completely. So, like I said, the most significant difference to note is this public celestial object after the class galaxy statement, which says that galaxy inherits celestial object, but does public inheritance. Uh, the public qualifier says the access level for inherited members of the base class, and that really needs a debate of its own, which it will get. Our galaxy class has its own members, but can also access members of celestial object, and it inherits these as the de derived class. This is demonstrated in the, opera in the insertion operator, where we call getName, which is actually a member of celestial object, not a member of galaxy class itself at all. Now, we said we were going to do something about access, and access is really the public statement. So if we actually had de kept the private declaration in celestial object, then we would get errors if we tried to assess name in the class below it. Because name is a private member of celestial object, and private really does mean private. Even derived classes cannot access private data from the base class. Of course, you could just have used the getName function, which is public, so it's accessible anywhere. We could instead make the base class data public, as before, but would lose protection from the outside class. And as usual, C provides a better way to deal with the problem we just highlighted. There's a third access specifier for class members, which is protected. Remember, private means access is granted only to other class members and friends. Protected members, this access is extended to derived classes. So if in the celestial object we've declared everything to be protected, then it would have been perfectly fine and we would have had no problem at all. So, it's fine to do that, but essentially we modified the access level of the data members in the base class. But there's also a statement here, the public, in the inheritance statement. So what access level is actually given to these inherited members in the derived class? How does it work? It's a combination of the two. When using public, the access level of our inherited non-private members are the same as they were in the base class. So protected members of the base class are inherited as protected members of the derived class. And you can summarize those rules in the table below. So you've got three choices for how you inherit the base class, so the derived class specifier, private, protected, and public. And you've got three choices for how you declare an element in the base class, private, protected, and public. If it's private in the base class, there's no inheritance. If it's protected in the base class, it's either private if it's inherited privately or protected in the two other cases. And if it's actually public in the base class, it's completely equal to whatever we, how we inherit the derived class. So if we inherit it privately, it becomes private in the base class, in the derived class, protected or public in the, in the derived class. And that's perfectly fine. It shows that the derived class access specifier is a request to set an access level but it may be denied because the base class specifier sets the maximum access level. Now, there was something clumsy about how we construct elements of a derived class that contain data of the base class. So let me show you again what I mean with that. When we called the statement to initialize the large Magellanic cloud as a galaxy, we invoke its parameterized constructor, but as you can see over there, we 
we don't even know how the elements of the base class get constructed, but we initialize those at the moment in the body of the constructor. So where does it, the slashy object, get initialized? Well, if you don't specify a constructor, the default constructor is invoked when we create a galaxy, and then the explicit this time we change the entry. So this is slightly inefficient. Is it actually possible to invoke the celestial object's parameterized constructor so we can set up the celestial object data at the same time? Answer, yes. But how? The parameterized constructor for galaxy containing parameters for both galaxy and the celestial object is shown below. And essentially what you do, you call the celestial object function over here, the celestial object constructor first, and then initialize the elements in the derived class. So you've got these four parameters for the celestial object and the one parameter for galaxy. Uh, the body of the function contains, which is in this case is empty, in principle should contain operations specific to galaxy alone, not specific to the base class. So we now use two sets of constructors, both base class and derived constructors. It looks like the base class constructor gets called from within the derived constructors, it gets called secondly. But if you actually add print statement to the constructors and destructor, so you'll realize that the base class constructors are keep called first, followed by the derived class constructor. The reverse must happen for the destructor, just essentially to make sure that the uh, data remains, remains sensible while you destruct things. So, that's the way it works, and now we can do something with this. The one new feature that we can have in a base and a derived class, that we can have the idea of overriding functions. That almost looks like overloading functions, but it's not the same. C++ allows us to define function in a base and derived class with exactly the same name and exactly the same arguments. That's called overriding. Function overriding only makes sense when done in separate derived class. So what you really are doing, you're rewriting the operation of a base class function to suit the specific needs of the derived class function. That's clearly different from overloading, which allows more than one function with the same name to be defined within the same class. Overriding requires both functions to have exactly the same parameter list. So there's no difference at all in the way they look, but overriding a function requires, overloading a function requires different parameter list. So you overload functions within the same class, so they can take different arguments, perform similar tasks, and you overwrite functions of a base class to redefine their functionality in the derived class using identical parameter list. That becomes particularly important if you use multiple inheritance. C++ does not just restrict us to a single inheritance. You can inherit from multiple sources, and have multiple level of inheritance to create a whole class hierarchy if you like. Each class in the hierarchy inherits members and extends their functionality to suit its own needs. Sometimes we want to inherit members from more than one class, and the syntax would just be class C inherits class A and class B publicly. And if you create a constructor for C, you can first call the constructor for A, B, and then the one for the entries in C, and that's perfectly fine. If you glue all of this together in a short piece of code, which you can download and play with as well. We've got a class A and class B, which are essentially identical apart from the fact that they output AX and BX. Um, and then we've got a class C that inherits both, has its own storage. Both of these functions have a show function, and that really means that this would inherit two show functions, but no, it doesn't. It actually defines its own show function, which actually outputs AX, BX, and CX in one row. That is a sensible, if, if a slightly artificial, example of multiple inheritance. Uh, you might also want to create more than one level of inheritance, for example, a linear chain. So, for example, think that you've got a Newton star, which clearly is, could be inherited from a star, which in, in itself could be inherited from a celestial object again. And I showed you just part of the code that defines the star. A star is a spectral class. Uh, the standard constructors and all the other stuff gets done. Then we also have a neutron star, which is, which is a star. It contains a radius, 
because the radius of neutron stars are quite interesting, and then essentially it contains all the constructors, etc., etc., as usual. And if you run that code, if you actually uh, define a Crab Nebula object with the right definitions, which is done in the code, you can clearly see it will output the new, the new ideas. So the, the problem with multiple inheritance is that your object really inherits members from both star and celestial object, so it goes it goes down this chain. And it will, if we actually call the Newton star constructor, the Newton star constructor will call the star constructor, the star constructor will call the celestial object constructor. So it's a rather complicated thing that happens behind the scenes. Now, there's one really important thing I want to say, surprisingly on only one slide, and that has to do with when to inherit, how inheritance works, and what the idea of specialization is. There's an enormous amount of, of abuse of inheritance online, and previous versions of this course definitely had the same mistake. The problem is the distinction between the relations is A or has A. Specialization is an is A relationship, okay? So, which really means a derived class is a special case of a base class. A man is a special case of a human. A boy is a special case of a child, etc., etc. And that should be contrasted with containment. Has a, it's a composite class, it has a member that's an object of another, of another class. And similar to has a, it actually belongs to, and they're usually lumped together. If something belongs to something else, it's not the same as is A. A good example of a has A relationship is a galaxy that contains a solar system. A solar system contains stars and planets, all of which would be inherited of celestial object. They should not be inherited, solar systems should not be inherited from galaxy, and stars should, stars should not be inherited from solar system. That's kind of obvious if you think about it, but it's a mistake that gets quite common made. So essentially distinguish those two relationships incredibly carefully. Now, let's summarize. What we've done today, we've looked at inheritance, which allows members of a class to be incorporated within another class. It extends the functionality of the existing class, which is we should call the base class, by adding new members in the derived class. Not all members need to be inherited. This is controlled by so-called access specifiers, and a new access specifier called protected allows base class members to be accessed in the derived class, but not outside the class hierarchy. Derived class constructors need to call the base class constructors the latter are called first and the related destructor last. Function overriding allows base class member functions to be redefined in derived classes, otherwise they are just inherited. Classes can inherit multiple base classes, and one can create more than one level of inheritance. <coughs> and that's it for today.